My name is Serena Nichols, and I'm the UX design lead at um, Red Hat for the uh, developer tool area. Thanks for joining me today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I, was an, I have an undergrad in computer science and was a UI developer for about 15 years. Um, and then I, I had that kind of, it was a long time ago, so I had that hybrid role when they didn't have UX where I was always designing and developing at the same time. And then um, I, I formally kind of transferred out of that hybrid role into the UX field just about 15 years ago. And then I went back and, and got my master's in human factors. So I've um, been studying and practicing UX for quite a long time. Uh, so now I'm, I'm leading, uh, I've been at Red Hat for about five years, and I'm leading the DevTools area. Specifically, what I'm going to be talking about today is the OpenShift developer experience that was introduced in OpenShift 4.2. So curious by a show of hands, are any of you UI developers? All right, yeah, okay. Are anybody, is anybody a designer? And does anybody use OpenShift? Okay, cool, awesome. Let's see here. Now I just have to figure out how to move the slide. <laughs> There we go, sorry. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about designing a user experience that developers love. Um, I'm gonna discuss the process around what, how that process might look, and then dive a little bit into developer experience as a case study. So the first half is kinda of gonna be around the UX process, and the second half will be along, around um, OpenShift itself as a case study. So anybody who works on software in general likely already knows this. Um, it's pretty hard to develop, to develop something that users love, right? It takes a lot of time and dedication. And in an ideal world, um, kind of three groups work together to get this stuff done. It's product management, user experience, and development. So let's talk about the three-headed monster. Uh, product managers usually set the product vision and um, set the project goals, and they have intimate knowledge around the competition in the market, and they prioritize the backlog whereas UXD leads the user experience. This includes end-to-end -end flows, visual design, research, and feedback loops. And then we usually have a UI dev lead who determines how the user experience is implemented, and of course, other projects, I mean, other developers behind the scenes doing a lot of the technical work, but I'm just gonna be talking about those three spots for the most part. So with these three, when these three leads are, um, and teams collaborate, the outcome's a lot more positive, right? So I'm just showing here um, and the overlap of some of the work between, or the roles between product management and UX. It's a great visualization of, of how those interact. Um, so I think I had, was there one designer here? I'm curious if whoever the designer was has works with a PM. You don't do PM. Okay, yeah, which makes, I think it makes it a lot more difficult. Typically, like the product manager also has product knowledge, they know about the market, um, and all that kind of stuff as well. So, um, so what's nice about a role definition between the three areas is it helps to uh, articulate why the roles, um, or how you, the PM and UX need to communicate. So uh, now I'm going to now take a few more minutes to discuss some design stuff. So from a really high level perspective, um, it's pretty easy to generalize uh, the different UX maturity levels by if you're engaging in proactive or reactive design, right? So this image is really associated with reactive management styles, but it's kind of the same thing. When you do reactive design, Usually, the developer is just developing and hasn't thought of the end-to-end -end flows or hasn't necessarily thought about the users or where they, maybe they have, but they're more thinking, of, they haven't spoken to the users. So essentially, what happens with reactive design is development team implements something. Designers, uh, they come and ask the developers, hey, can you help us out? And it's like, or they're finding out from their users that there's issues and we have to fix them. But does that mean reactive design is bad? Definitely not, because at least you're going back and fixing things, right? And oftentimes, when you're in a fast-moving market, you don't necessarily have time for, to do the upfront design either. So, you know, sometimes it, it, that happens and it, and it works out well. 
But the proactive design approach is a lot better, in my opinion. Um, you're informed by actual user needs, not by guesses. Um, and this is a, a quote by uh, Jared Spool, right? You promote what an ideal user experience could be. So in my mind, I call this design-led. Um, it, but being proactive definitely requires a process change and also takes time and patience. Um, so does it mean that people should always be proactive? It, always, it depends on the product you're working on. If it's a brand new product and you have enough time to do it, it's the best thing to do. But we don't always have time. And also, companies don't always have money, nor does open source, right? Um, so now to dive a little bit more into once you decide if you're going to do proactive uh, design, which process should you use? We have, um, there's two main pro processes in my mind, user-centered design and design thinking. Uh, but as I mentioned in the beginning, I've been in the field a long time, and in my mind, these are just kind of buzzwords around the same process. Um, there's not much difference in between them, and if you do some searching on the internet, read books, go to classes, you often find different visualizations uh, for the same processes. So I'm just gonna go th quickly through four. Um, this is UCD depiction, which puts it super simple, right? You're gonna do analysis where you research your users, then you do your design where you're designing for the users, evaluate where you test, and then implement. So this one's fairly easy. Um, and this one's a lot more complex. But it's also got a lot of nice detail in it. It calls out some of the specifics, so the different methodologies to use the different uh, discoveries. So competitor analysis, audience def definition, user scenarios, content sur surveys, all part of discovery. And then you have your concept section, and then your prototyping and user testing. So this, this diagram doesn't actually include the development piece itself. And then if I switch over to design thinking, um, this one's pretty neat in my, in my opinion because it starts with the line that says awareness. So you're doing research so that you can empathize with your users, then you define what you want to do, then you ideate and prototype, and then you validate. And it shows that it's all uh, iterative. And the really cool thing at the end to me is that it shows that you've made an impact at the end, right, if you're following these, um, these methods. Uh, the other thing that this is not showing is kind of like the diverge and converge, so come up with a ton of ideas or a ton of designs and then come, down, come back with the best. And then here's the, the final one I'm that just showing again. This is more a little bit more um, detailed around design thinking where it's kind of putting it in three major areas, understand, explore, and materialize. But again, like it's all pretty much the same type of um, steps throughout the process. So since we only have an hour, I'm going to dive into one piece of this uh, part of the research, which is around the research and analysis phase, which is who's going to use it, right? So in order to design meaningful experiences, you have to understand and empathize. So there's two major methods that I've used in the past. One is personas. Um, I think people are probably very familiar with these. It's uh, part of your audience research. It includes demographics, details like age and gender, what motivates you, what your responsibilities are, frustrations, etc. cetera. Um, but it's usually, if you're talking about personas, it's like who is, who is a person using your software and what, how do they feel or what's their background, um, which can be very helpful. We also have something now that are called behavioral archetypes. Um, so they're more focused on user behavior. They contain details from user interviews around the group's needs, um, what their motivations are and what their pain points are. So they focus more on who does what, when they do it, and why. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that you can have multiple archetypes. No, a person can have multiple archetypes as they're going throughout the journey of your product, depending on their goals. So that was the initial portion around design, and now um, I'm gonna switch over to the OpenShift case study. Well, curious if anybody has any questions as, as I'm going through, please let me know. I'm not doing live demos. I have some screenshots and uh, animated GIFs because the, the connection 
here as well as going back home is not fast enough for me to do it. So apologize about that. So again, designing a developer experience that works for everyone is a really interesting challenge. Um, developer goals vary, and as they come from different organizations with different levels of proficiency, it's pretty hard to create an ideal, uh, um, an ideal interface that makes everybody super happy. So, uh, and then, you know, there's a lot of design challenges, not to mention additional com um, com complexities of working with open source projects. And when I, when I mean that, it's that, um, OpenShift is working with a lot of different projects. Not only that, we're working with a lot of operators, right? And a lot of operators are coming in at various times, and we are trying to create UI and a UI interface for things that um, we don't necessarily know when they're coming. So it's 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 been um, it's interesting but fun challenge, I would say. So I mentioned the three-headed monster before. Today I'm going to discuss how our three-headed monster kind of approaches the problem. So here you have a fun picture showing the UI dev lead, the UX lead, and the PM leads. Actually, our PM lead, the guy on the right-hand side, Steve Spiker, was supposed to co-present with me, but I'm here alone. So it would have been a lot more fun if he was here to have his face shown in person. Um, and this actually, it's not really an accurate description kind of of our monster heads, because we really have additional PMs representing other things. So Steve is the PM associated with DevTools, the developer experience. But then we also have PMs for Knative, um, Tecton pipelines, CodeReady workspaces, Helm, Helm charts, GitOps that we're constantly working with and, and getting their stuff into the UI. So um, the UX and UI teams, are, it's a large collaborative team. And as I mentioned before, you know, the more we collaborate, the more the product works, and the better the product comes out. Um, for the developer experience of OpenShift 4, we just started the process last, five, last February. So we had a face-to-face -face in Bangalore with our team, and we had a, a few small um, ground rules, which makes sense, but it was great that they were um, written down and everybody agreed that PM has a final say on features, right? And what, what the timeline is or what's kind of focused for a release. UX has a final say on user experience. And then UI dev has a final say on how things are developed. But that doesn't mean, and first of all, that's not just the leads, it's the entire team. Um, but that doesn't mean people don't you know, impact the other areas. So developers are always talking about, oh, I'm not sure that it makes, that makes sense. What, you know, could we change the user experience? As well as you know, sometimes, often, we're all doing the same thing um, but in the end, we all know the roles we play, and it really helps. It helps to set expectations and have healthy conversations and better outcomes. So I know a couple of you said that you knew much, a little bit about OpenShift or knew some about OpenShift. But for those who don't, OpenShift's been around since 2011. Um, and the decision to standardize on Kubernetes in 2014 changed the game plan for OpenShift. So, in 2015, OpenShift 3 was launched. A lot of people knew about that for a long time. It had its own console. Um, they had a, a, a web console that was not as focused on cluster admin, administration as it is today in 4.0. Um, and then at the end of 2018, CoreOS was acquired, and CoreOS had a lot of great, had a lot of great technology that we were able to now use in OpenShift, including operators, um, integration with Prometheus and Grafana, and being able to provide some really cool monitoring capabilities. So after the acquisition, it was pretty interesting because the OpenShift console at that time was written in Angular J uh, JS. And there was a discussion around upgrading from Angular to either NG or to React. And CoreOS had, their product was Tectonic, which was already written in React. So it was actually really kind of cool because they had originally decided to go to React. Then when CoreOS was acquired, it kind of finalized it. Since CoreOS's product called Tectonic was already written in React, we used that as our code base and then started to bring in some of the features from OpenShift over to the, um, the React code base. So if those of you who know OpenShift in 4.0, it was predominantly cluster administration, right? So we didn't, we lost a lot of the end to end flows that we had in, um, in OpenShift 3 because 
we ha didn't have time to, to bring everything over in, in React. So that's what this whole developer experience was around, is, is, is now creating a new developer experience, which is more focused um, on the end-to-end -end goals. So our main design goals were to provide a higher level of abstraction for the Kubern of Kubernetes. Now let me re remind this, say this again though, this is just on the developer side. So there's two perspectives in OpenShiftNet today. There is an admin perspective and a developer perspective. As a user, you can go into both of them, doesn't matter, but as a developer, you're gonna have limited functionality just because of role base access. So as I said, the design goals is to provide a higher level of abstraction of Kubernetes. So we don't wanna for force people who are developers to have to know about Kubernetes. It's okay if they wanna learn more, they can. If they know about it, we still allow them to access things, but we're not forcing them to have to know that. We provide an application-centric focus. Um, you give developers an optimized experience with the features uh, that they're most likely need to be to productive. So what we're talking about here is like efficiency. A lot of the things that we're doing is kind of like, can we do something in one or two clicks? Or, you know, rather than having to enter all kinds of data. We allow users to access advanced options and edge cases, but again, it just takes a little bit more and sometimes we hide some of that stuff. And we treat workloads as first-class citizens. So I talked about personas and archetypes before, archetypes before, and so these are the behavioral archetypes we created for our initial release. We talked about the fact that there's an OpenShift Explorer, so you wanna come in and discover and quickly learn about OpenShift. We have an application builder who needs to quickly assemble an application. We also have a code locator. So this one was an interesting one. It was like somebody needs to locate a service that has a problem and they see a service that has a problem in OpenShift and they won't, need to quickly be able to identify where that code is so that they can edit it in their IDE. We have the application deployer who might sit inside of their IDE all day writing code, but they deploy to OpenShift and then they come into OpenShift to monitor it or see how their application is assembled. And then we have the application monitor, and that uh, is, you know, I wanna view the components in my application, see how they're connected, see what the health of my app is, and what the connectivity is between them. Now, although we started with these five archetypes, we have uh, continued to kind of add a few more, and in addition to that, we didn't necessarily implement all the functionality associated with all of these in the first couple of releases, right? So OpenShift is released uh, every three months, and um, 4.3, so our second version of the developer perspective was just released on Friday. Um, so we're currently working on that third iteration, but like I said, three month iterations are pretty quick, so um, I'm gonna kinda talk a little bit about all of those now. So the developer perspective has simplified navigation, so if you can see the top item there, it's actually a way to switch between developer and admin. And when you switch, the entire navigation changes. But when you're in the developer perspective, we really only have five main areas. Um, topology, we think, is our main area where people will spend the most time. From there, you can add things to the project. Um, you can build your application from within topology, and you can also monitor from within there as well. But we have specific areas, like add is an area where we add things from. Builds, you can see your builds and build configs. Pipelines is where we see Tecton pipelines. And then we hide a bunch of stuff under advanced. Things like project access, project dashboards, um, a search capability, and eventing. So the user experience is enhanced as additional operators are installed. So as you saw, a pipelines, um, element inside of the navigation area, that was because the, Open Shift, the pipelines operator was installed. We also support OpenShift serverless, so that means we bring in Knative services, we bring in um, event sources um, when that operator is there. We also have a service binding operator, which is pretty cool. So this operator supports bi um, the binding capabilities, so if you have an operator back service, which is a database, and you wanna connect objects, that service binding is the way to go. And then Eclipse J is our upstream of Code Ready Workspaces, which is our downstream, which is the IDE. So if you have that integration, um, 
it allows you to do more things. And I'll, I'll show you a couple examples of that. So now I'll talk about the progression of our topology view. And really, one of the reasons I talked about the history of OpenShift is um, Steve, the PM, and myself were both the leads for admin console for about a year and a half before we switched over here. So we had a, a lot of knowledge on what users wanted from the developer perspective already, but it was just a different UI. So we had already been talking about topology and how would developers want to see their topology. So about a year before our group assembled on the developer side, we had already started, or one of our designers, Chris Shin, had already dis dis start, started doing a lot of discovery. So this was an exercise where people at Summit had actually like drawn out what their applications looked like and then did some brainstorming around you know, how that might look, how, um, how pods would be displayed, how workloads would be shown, what kind of details were there, health, build status, all kinds of things like that. And through design iterations, these things were just continued to be um, iterated on and came up with new ideas. So this, like I said, this stuff all happened before last February when we started on the project. So it was really good because by the time the project started, we were able to create an initial prototype with a lot of background and data, um, which actually ends up looking very similar to what we, we built, um, built based upon a lot of research. So uh, this is just kind of showing, you know, you have a front end and a back end. You have a side panel when you select a node. You see all kinds of details on the right-hand side. It just had shown, um, this is showing it scaling up. So in our initial prototype, you can actually see when, when this finishes or, or when it starts. Let's see. There, we used to show like the number of pods as, as, as portions or segments around the circle. Now we're not doing it that as anymore. We also used to have like the way that we navigated differently. So we, we've done quite a but, but bit of work since our uh, initial prototypes with that. So this is what our topology looks like uh, in, in 4.2. So topology represents the application-centric view of a project. It displays the different components in the project. So um, each workload, so each one of those elements, the circular elements kind of represent uh, uh, deployment or a deployment config. For those of you guys who know OpenShift, we have badges beforehand that is representing the resource type. Um, if you hover over that badge, you can see the resource type if you don't recognize it. Uh, and then if you select an element on the left-hand side, you get the side panel on the right that shows you all your resources. Um, we also kind of have this grouping, which is that white, you know, it's the shape changes based on your elements. Uh, but what that is, is you're able to use the Kubernetes recommended labels for applications. Um, and then based on how you label things, we visualize an application. So now let's look at some of the other features that did ship. In order to provide efficient access to things, we have a number of decorators. We call them decorators. I don't know that that's what's going to be in the documentation. Um, but the things, four things on quadrants, right, the little circles or Mickey ears. Um, and those, what those things are, sometimes are visual indicators of status, and other times they're indicating that there's an action can occur. So the top right one allows you to open up the URL. So if a route is there, you can have a one-click access to open up your application. The bottom right-hand one, that's that code um, decorator that I was talking about. So if you do not have the CHE or Code Ready Workspaces operator installed, what it does is it brings you right to your Git repo re repository. If you have CHE or um, Code Ready Workspaces installed, it will bring you right into our workspace with your code in context. The bottom left-hand corner, uh, this one's showing its build indicator. You sometimes can either have a build or a pipeline, a Tecton pipeline associated with it. So th that's showing the status of whichever you have. And then what's not shown here, what's coming in 4.4, is we're going to have a fourth indicator on the top left, which kind of shows you, do you have warnings with any of uh, your associated workloads, or is there a problem um, with any of your health checks that you might have set up for your app?
Okay, and now this is showing the route decorator. So you saw the route decorator was up there on the top right-hand corner. I click it, it just brings up a new tab. There's my app. Um, so pretty simple. And these are the kind of things that um, we've heard from customers wanting to be able to have these flows be super efficient. Another one here is um, the code decorator. So this is ex the example of I don't have Che installed or Code Ready Workspaces, but when I click on that icon, it brings me right to my code repo, which is pretty cool. And that again goes back to that archetype that I had discussed. And here, this is showing that we, with the build it, uh, decorator, we have one click access to build logs, which again was something that was really important for users when we spoke to them. Also, that indicator in the top, bottom left-hand corner will change between states, right? It will show you the running state, um, whether it's successful or error, and that would, you know, if it was an error, you'd that, or were even running for a long time, that might necessitate you to go to the logs. Um, so filtering by applications, we also have this ability to filter by applications. So by default, if you have multiple applications inside your project, you see it all, but there is that secondary selector that allows you to kind of flip back and forth and have more of a specific zone, uh, kind of zone in onto a specific application. And what's going to be really cool about that is in, um, in coming up soon once we have monitoring inside of uh, the developer perspective, you'll be able to have application-specific metrics as well. Uh, we're going to be adding a tab on the right-hand side of the side panel. That will allow, it will be a monitoring tab, and it's going to show you some graphs as well as um, alerts associated with the object in context, whether it's an application or a workload. So building your application, I talked about this before, like this is the page that you either see when you go into a new project that's empty and no workloads exist, or when you go to the add section. So we have um, kind of end-to-end -end flows where, uh, where you can import from Git, deploy an image um, from an internal or external registry, access our developer catalog, import from a Docker file, import YAML, or um, add a database. And our developer catalog is interesting as well because we have operator back services in there. We have templates. Um, we have builder images. We also, in 4.4, what's coming is help, help charts as well, which is kind of cool. So there's a lot of um, a different types of items that you can go into the catalog for to help build your application. And this is just showing you the import from Git flow. So um, doesn't look super exciting, but the reason I like to show it is this is showing first you create your application, I'm sorry, your project. But what, what we've done is we've had most of our forms only make you give the, the really necessary information. So you can see here, I put in the Git repo. It auto detects the builder image type. It automatically sets the name of my application, sets the name of my workload. I could then, if I want to, uh, create a deployment or a deployment config or make it Knative and serverless. Um, but all I really have to do is put the name of my Git repo in and then hit go and I'm done. But again, if you want more advanced options, be able to change things, you can do so. So. This is another piece. Um, I talked about the service binding operator, and so we're taking advantage of that in, I think it's in 4.4 we're releasing this. Um, so it enables applications to use external services by automatically collecting and sharing the binding information, so the credentials, uh, connection details, secrets, config maps. All you really do, and I, didn't, I couldn't do this, um, again, I'm sorry because it, the, the, I couldn't get it live, Essentially, when you, sh when you hover over one of the elements in, in, the, um, in the graph, you see a little arrow, and you can just kind of pull that arrow over and try to drop it onto another target. So if you see the one that shows the, the OpenShift logo, I just kind of drag that over to the one that's got the PGO uh, icon, let it go, and it created my bindings for me automatically. So if, again, if anybody was here in the OpenShift 3 time frame, 
when we had the service catalog and they were talking about the ability to bind things. This is kind of doing the same thing. It's doing that work for you. So the user doesn't have to go and manually create and, and share that information. The service binding operator helps you do that. So again, it, it makes things much more efficient. Uh, this is showing some of the functionality that we have in 4.4. So Tekton pipelines, again, if you have the operator installed, we have a tech preview version of this. Um, this is a version, this is just showing you all of the pipelines. The most interesting piece in my mind is the last, last task status piece. So that's saying the last time I had a pipeline run, um, what are the statuses of all of the tasks that are comprised of my, in my pipeline? You can hover over and get a lot more details, but it gives you a really nice bird's eye view there. And then if you wanted to drill in, you can go into that pipeline run and it shows a visualization of um, your pipeline. So not sure if people uh, know much about pipelines, but at a really high level, um, there's serial tasks uh, and non-serial tasks. So you have to run code compile first. Once that's complete, you can go to compile and test. Once that's complete, you can start unit test and security check at the same time. And then once they're both complete, you can go back to image build. Um, so each one of those bubbles represents a task. And in a pipeline task, you can also have multiple steps. So um, if you see the underlines inside of the bubbles, that's representing the actual, the, in, the individual steps of the task. So uh, this is something that we definitely need to improve on because of a scalability issue. Um, but as you can see, like code compile just has a single task and it succeeded. If you look over at unit test, it had two tasks that were su was successful. Security check, I see they're all green. If you count, there's six. If there's gonna be more, it's gonna be pretty difficult to see. Um, and image build um, has two, one's in progress and one is pending, and that's what the two different colors of blue are. If I had the product running, you would see that if I hover over that, it gives you all that information in an easier format to view and read. Um, so it's something that we're gonna have to continually improve going forward. In 4.4, uh, well, I should say, we are targeting 4.4 to support Knative services as well. Um, we had them in, in 4.3, but we represented them differently. In 4.3, we showed, does anybody know anything about Knative services? Serverless? A little bit, okay. Um, so Knative services made up of a bunch of revisions. Those revisions have workloads associated with them. So the way we're, we are going to be visualizing this post 4.3 is we kind of have a grouping mechanism so that blue box, it's only blue because I have it selected, um, it's typically gray. But what we're showing there is all of the revisions that are inside of the traffic block. This is a really cool demo when it works, but I've tried doing it since I got here and I wasn't able to. Um, if you, so here you see three route deco decorators. On the rectangle, you see one up in the top right hand corner. Uh, you can see that there's two lines that are 50-50, so that's saying I have two revisions, each revision is getting 50% of my traffic. Typically for, for Knative Serverless, what's happening is it's auto scaled to zero, right? So you would see both of those Node.js elements would really have like white circles because no pods are running. And as soon as you hit the route decorator on the top right hand corner, it starts spinning up one of those serverless, it, uh, it starts scaling up one of those servers, um, one of those revisions. And then you can actually, when, this, when the system is working quickly, it's really cool because you can see the app is, is loading or waiting to load. You see the pod come up and then you see the app, you know, the app start running really quickly. Um, so that's, it, it's a pretty cool uh, demo when, when you can run it. Um, we also have the ability to set, oops, set traffic distribution, which I guess I didn't show here. Um, so if you have multiple revisions, you can change, you know, you can go from 50-50 to 90-10. You can add additional revisions if there exist and that kind of thing. Um, again, for scalability reasons, we're only showing revisions that are associated with the um, traffic block. So now we're gonna talk about some feedback here. 
So um, feedback that we methods that we've used to date, we've used quite a few. So we do remote walkthroughs with customers. Well, we just have one customer that we're really um, integrated with right now, but we meet with them quarterly. So we had a lot more luck being able to interact with customers when we were working on the admin console. It's really easy to find cluster administrators. It's really hard to find the developers who are using OpenShift or, or developing on OpenShift that aren't Red Hatters or that aren't OpenShifters, right? Um, so it's taken us some time to start creating those relationships. So this first one, I can talk about them because they tweet about meeting with us. So, we have a really good relationship with UNC back in, in um, the United States. Um, and we've been able to do a lot of good work with them. Uh, and so we meet with them quarterly around the developer perspective and got a, have gotten a lot of great information with them. We've also gone to use, use, done usability testing at conferences. So at Red Hat Summit, we do, we, last year we did it at DevConf. Um, here we did it in the US at DevConf and in India, actually. Uh, we've also gone to Code One and do testing. We have regular feedback sessions with our, our SA Tiger team, so our solution architects, as well as with some of our de developer and evangelists. So, you know, if we can't necessarily reach our developers, we're looking for developer advocates who are talking to our developers daily. We've done a lot of surveys and a lot, gotten a lot of great information. Um, We've started our on-site customer visits. Well, just one visit in person, but it was with six customers in, De in December, which was great. We'd gone to London and met with a bunch of the people in the FSI um, sector. And uh, it was really enlightening, too, because you know what we're realizing, we, we know this, but, but what you see is the differentiation between how cluster admins um, set up their clusters, what they allow their uh, developers to access, and what they don't. So, it was really interesting in that we, we learned that you know, a lot of times they just shut their catalog, the, the developer catalog right off and don't allow access for their customers to that, which is interesting for us to know when we're, when we're exposing a lot of our, um, the ways that we allow people to develop or build apps through the catalog. Uh, we, we have piloted an OpenShift developer user's office hour, and it's still going. So this is open to Red Hatters. Uh, customers and um, and the community, and it's open feedback. We we demo and get feedback, and then we put those uh, those recordings back up onto YouTube so people can go take a look at them. And we just started a database to try to collect all the feedback, so it can be analyzed and we can share metrics on like the you know you asked we acted type of thing. So I'll show you some of the specific examples around um, what we heard during some of our feedback sessions and how we responded to those. So um, again, like what, when we do a rolling update or a recreate rollout, um, in 3.11 what they used to do was they had the visualization that's on the right-hand side, right? So they're showing that initial pod um, spinning up the new pod when it's scaled up, then they get rid of the old pod. But it was shown on the right-hand side of, of um, or the details page of the deployment config. The problem with that was that if you're inside a topology and you didn't have that item selected, you never knew what was going on. So we ended up changing. So now, as you just saw, you kind of see that visualization internally inside of the node or the element that's on the left-hand side. So that was one big change that we made um, based on feedback. Another one was uh, easy way to scale up and down. So um, in 4.2, we had a dialogue that said, I want to say it said edit count or something like that. It wasn't very easy to understand that, you, that it was associated with pods or anything. So we ended up putting this pod donut on the side panel. And it's a one-click access if you want to scale up or down or however many clicks it takes to get to the number of pods you want. And then this was another great one, I thought. We had a lot of feedback, both from developer evangelists as well as UNC and, and at Summit, that people wanted to be able to see the number of pods. So what we're doing right now, by default, is we're showing like the runtime or the builder image associated with things inside of those uh, deployments and deployment configs. 
And post 4.3, we introduce or are introducing a, um, a pod count filter that allows you to switch back and forth. So if you always want to see pods, configure it that way once, and you never have to change it again. Um, or you can keep it using the image. We also now allow you to switch between graph and the list view of topology. Um, in 3.x, we had something called a project overview, which a lot of customers really liked. And when we improved the, so we've recently just improved the topology view now to allow you to switch back and forth between the graphical view and the more list-like view, list view that was uh, very similar to what we had in project overview. I think this is great. A lot of people, you know, some people are visual. Others don't want to, you know, aren't interested in looking at the pictures and really want to see the data. So this gives the, the user the option to switch back and forth. And again, this is something that we consistently heard when we started doing our, our interviews. Um, and I think I mentioned this. We, so we started the project last February and March. We already started that, I'm sorry, yeah, that March we started doing um, collecting some information back and getting feedback sessions. So it's, it's really been, we've got a lot of really great data. Another thing that we had heard about is in OpenShift today, um, in order to provide access to projects, the way that you do it in the admin area is you have to go through role bindings, and it's pretty difficult. So, you know, they asked, is there a way for me to just say, hey, if I have access to my project, can I just say I want to share it, you know? So this is a, an easy, really easy way, and it's hidden inside of the advanced navigation item, but it's a really easy way to um, add access for another person and then allow them to either have admin view or edit access. If they themselves don't have that role binding capability, it won't even be, that navigation item won't even be shown in the, in the nav. So now I'm gonna go to lessons learned. So um, the key to success is, in my mind, is to be collaborative and iterative at every stage. You know, feedback is really important, so get it early and often. If you can't find developers, connect with their advocates. Um, developers in different verticals really have different constraints, and that's kind of what I was talking about, where the cluster administrator might set up that cluster differently for OpenShift. But I mean, the same thing applies to all different products, right? Different users use it differently and might have different configuration. Another thing is you can't satisfy everyone. It's very interesting because I, the last, you know, the last probably month or so, every feedback session we've had has been super positive. And on Thursday, I met with somebody and they were like, oh my God, the, oh wait, who leads the developer experience? And I was like, me. And they had some really negative stuff to say, and I was like, oh, darn it, you know, like, it, it was going so well. But that's good, right? Because the more, you can continually improve things. If, you, if everybody always says it's awesome, it's not gonna get any better, right? You wanna hear that constructive criticism constantly. Um, working with the latest and greatest tech isn't easy. And this goes back, you know, I, I'm not sure that it's, it's probably not just open source, but if we're working with one of these operators, and, you know, or, or something that's going into OpenShift that's a new API and code freezes almost around the same time, you know, you really have to time things really well. It's probably software in general, right? But um, it's always fun when we just had a code freeze on Friday, so it was really fun to see what actually got in. Um, and working with upstream technologies is also interesting, right? Because based on... Um, your team and your company, how much effect you have in that upstream technology. Things don't necessarily go the way that you might plan it at the beginning of a release. At the end of the release, it might not be exactly what you wanted. And like I said, sometimes the even, even the best laid plans don't work. So what's coming next? We have a lot of exciting things. We've got Helm chart support. We have project metrics. We have a pipeline builder coming out. Um, when I say pipeline builder, I mean through the UI. Event source creation, that's again with Knative. And we're going to be introducing a cloud terminal. This stuff is all coming post 4.3, not sure if it's 4.4, 4.5, but they're all things that we have designs for and some implementation already started. So for OpenShift developers, I think it's gonna be great. Um, we're gonna continually be adding more functionality. And of course, you know, more collaboration and feedback with customers developer advocates, um, community, and Red Hatters. 
So with that, that is actually the end of my presentation. Um, love to see, you know, let us know what you think. Try out the OpenShift developer perspective. We have a Google group, which if you join that Google group, it just essentially right now, it's telling you the, the time and date of our office hour. So join our, our office hour or the feedback sessions. You also get a, um, a link to the YouTube videos so you can watch it offline. Um, and as always, we want to hear feedback. So we have an email address. So feel free to send us an email with any or all feedback uh, on the user experience. So I'm also happy to open it up for questions, discussions. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, how you um, uh, created those? Yes. So, so actually what we did, I'm going to go back to that slide. Oh, sure. He said that I, um, he wanted me to go back and explain a little bit more about the archetypes. So let me see if I can go back here super quickly. Um, so what we did was when we first had our face-to-face, -face, we talked about all the functionality and what the initial goals of the product were. And then we tried, so then we were looking at all the documentation around archetypes and how you build them. And so they're supposed to be, right, around who does what when. So we took those user flows and started to try to figure out, okay, if the goal is for OpenShift to be kind of like an onboarding tool and somebody is going to come in and want to be able to explore and you want them to come in very quickly and easily to do things, um, that's how we created the OpenShift Explorer, right? So we kind of, we, we kind of tried to take some of those main end-to-end -end flows that we needed to support and then started talking to developer advocates and a, a few customers that we were able to talk to. Um, and these were our five main groupings since then. Like we now have a pipeline admin, so a pipeline administrator, which again, so like some of these things, the pipeline administrator, for, for example, you don't set up pipelines very frequently. So it's definitely a distinctive, um, a distinctive behavior like archetype because you're doing a specific activity and have a specific goal in mind, but you're not necessarily doing that all the time. Does that help answer it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Has anybody used archetypes? No. I mean, I think personas are really like the biggest thing going, but I personally really liked the activity. And it also helped like the designer and the developer kind of focus in on for this flow, who's actually, what are they trying to do? Um, and I, I'm not sure that people already, always know that. Yeah, so I, I'm going to go back. Um, so personas are typically like, it's talking about a specific person who uses the, the interface. Um, and it, you know, like these are like a typical format where it talks about motivations, goals, how much experience you have, what are your age, that kind of thing. Uh, and whereas the archetypes are more around behavior, so it's who does what, when they do it, and why. So it's more around a specific user flow. So you might have the same persona that is, is, is mapped to multiple archetypes. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you comment more about what, what leads uh, to removing a design feature? Huh. You mentioned that with the, like, with the uh, circle segments indicating mm. Right. Okay. So I'll uh, let me go back to the specific instance. So the question was, um, how do you go about removing features? So I had referenced the fact that in our topology view, at one point, um, actually, you can see it here, right? Uh, no. At one point, we had multiple segments. Here it is, um, the one that says front end node. Like you could see, there was four segments there. Um, so to me, that one's not necessarily removing a feature that was more around the usability feedback we got and because of scalability, it didn't make sense. Uh, because when you scaled that up to 10, you're, you get super overloaded, right? So that's why we changed that was more, not a removal of functionality, but more about changing the experience because it just didn't seem to work. Um, and, and then when we switched 
Thank you. When we switched from segments to a single arc per type or per status, we then got the feedback, well, now I don't know how many pods I have. So that's why we went to the option where we have uh, this, nope, the viewing the pod count. That's why we gave this option, right? Because we originally allowed you to see it through the arc. Removing functionality is a big thing that UX doesn't typically have, you know, it's PM usually has the final say on that one. It's a, that's a difficult thing to do. I, yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer on that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? All right, thanks for your time. Oh, one more. Sure. Yes. So, right, so it's really interesting. We had a, our OpenShift UX team, we actually have three kind of mini teams uh, within our OpenShift UX side. People focusing on developers, people focusing on admin, and then there's a multi-cluster CNV and storage section as well. And we had a face-to-face -face last September, -ish, last fall. And um, the research team is actually doing a lot of interviews, like one-on-one -on -one interviews, and they're doing something like this, they, creating a database for the nuggets that they get, right? Um, and that's what they're focused on. But this past, uh, like a month ago, we started doing it inside the developer perspective for our own utilization. So it's a pilot for us. We're really, right now, what we're doing is we're using a Google Sheet. It's not the greatest, but we're trying to pilot all of the information that we got since last March by the end of this month and see where it takes us. We want to be able to have some really nice visualizations that show like the value of what we've been doing and how we've responded and how that feedback has worked. Um, not only for, you know, for multiple reasons, for, you know, to show the value of what we're, our UX team is doing, but also, um, to show the users that we're really listening and, you know, so we heard this five times and this is how we responded, that kind of stuff, you know. So we really want to utilize that to help start creating blogs and, um, and sharing the information out that way. Yeah. Anything else? Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.